Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Talking About Marketing is a podcast for business owners and leaders produced by my dad, Steve Davis, and his colleague at Talked About Marketing, David Olney, in which they explore marketing through the lens of their own four Ps, person, principles, problems, and perspicacity. Yes, you heard that correctly. Apart from their love of words, they really love helping people. So they hope this podcast will become a trusted companion on your journey in business. David, I'm nervous about the title for this particular episode, Misery, Tragedy and Community, because it kind of sounds like three dwarves from a really dark version of Snow White. Yeah, I'm really wondering how dwarf number three is going to get over dwarf number one and two. (laughs) However, the thing about this podcast and our approach to life is we've got to be eyes open, so to speak. Oh, David, I didn't realise what I was just saying there. But we've got to be aware that there's negative in with all the good stuff. That's true. The negativity plays such a big role and we have to manage it. Yeah. So let's start managing it by strapping in for the first segment, All About the Person. Our four Ps. Number one, person. The aim of life is self-development to realise one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. Oscar Wilde. There's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about. That's the famous quip from Oscar Wilde. And obviously it's the quip after which our business and podcast is named. And I think, ironically and beautifully and poetically, we're going to be talking about Oscar Wilde in this first segment, all about the person. And David, this is partly due to you because you thankfully referred me to a brand new biography of Oscar Wilde, simply entitled Oscar by Matthew Sturgis. It is a tour de force, meticulously researched. As I said to you when I had got a couple of hours into it, I don't mind who Matthew Sturgis writes about from now on. I will listen to the book just because of the kind of quality biographer and writer he is. But really, listeners, important thing here is this is sort of part of our title today. So much of Oscar Wilde's life was tragic and full of misery, despite being born to a successful family and having the intellect he had and the educational opportunities. You know, he did not know how to spiral. Well, he did not know how to stop himself spiraling. Yes. And that's where the entry point is here. Something for all of us as owners or leaders of small businesses or entities of any sort is we have to take the reins and you know, push through even if we are uh, taken over by a sense of, well, whether it's tragedy, whether it's sadness, depression, things go right, things go wrong, it's something we have to deal with. And I'm hoping in this short conversation we can show ways to pinprick through whatever the grey clouds are so there's still some sun coming through so that we don't lose hope and we can move on. I was particularly moved by uh, some passages in the book in which Oscar Wilde had been jailed. He was jailed, as you may, may, may or may not know, for indecency. And while he was serving his term, very bleak conditions he uh, had no real access to anything to read which, until a governor with a, a late change in his um, prison situation towards the end of his term uh, restate, reinstated books. But he was he was lost. And it was yeah. only with the new governor, as he had conversation with him and was able to thank him, he made the comment that out of all this bleak experience in prison, he was about to forego comedy and dedicate his life 
to tragedy. That's how much it had affected him. And this is the man who left us with amazing bits of comedy, his aphorisms all through life, but also his his piece de resistance, which was the uh, the importance of being earnest. Let's just have a listen to this quick reflection uh, in jail. Wilde chose to believe that the improvement in his circumstances should be traced back to the Parisian production of Salome, which had obliged the government to accept that he was an artist of enduring and international repute. It was a base upon which to build. Frank Harris had assured him that he might find a regular outlet for his prose in the Saturday Review. There were projects he wanted to attempt. Comedy might have to be given up. I have sworn solemnly to dedicate my life to tragedy, he informed Warder Martin. If I write any more books, it will be to form a library of lamentations. Mm, so there's Oscar Wilde and, you know, everything is tragedy. David, there's something that came up in a conversation you and I had recently in which you coined a phrase, the consistency of misery, and that seemed to resonate with the, 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 the plight that Oscar Wilde went through, particularly through the latter half of his life, where he seemed to just cascade from one disaster to another. Yeah, it's a really interesting concept, and I came across it, you know, when I was still working on my PhD. It's an idea from an American psychiatrist called William Glasser, and Glasser was famous for two things, being at odds with mainstream psychiatry and being a very, very effective psychiatrist who helped a lot more people reliably than most mental health professionals could in the 1980s and 1990s because he'd seen some big ideas and followed them to their logical conclusion. And one of the big things he realized with people is we can cope with a bad day if the bad day isn't much worse than the last bad day. So we can get used to the consistency of misery and if you all think about it, you all know someone who if something positive happens, they'll immediately say something negative as if they're preparing for everything to go wrong again. And for Glasser, this was the consistency of misery. You get used to the idea that, well, bad days don't get worse. They stay the same. So if I make every day that equal level of bad, as much as it's not lovely, lovely is rare and fragile and gets my hopes up. But the consistency of misery, well, I'm still alive, I'm still functioning, and I don't get my hopes up, and the world hurts at a common, consistent level as I go along. And Glasser actually thought it was one of the biggest things that affects well-being, that you know, such a huge proportion of people live in the consistency of misery. And he would literally, after a few sessions with clients, explain the consistency of misery to them and then literally just ask them, are you aware that you are living in a permanent state of the consistency of misery? And it would often result in them going through meltdown and being very unhappy when they had the realisation mm. that he was correct. But then hopefully emboldened to be able to take some steps to lift themselves up. Otherwise, they're going to live the rest of their life like Eeyore, from mm. Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, and this was Glass's point. You know, once people had the realisation of, hang on, maybe he's right, Glass would sort of make the point, well, if you're up to doing something about it, let's get on with it. If you don't feel you're up to doing something about it or you don't think I'm the right person to help you, then let's just end this here and either you go find someone else or come back when you're feeling up to it. So he would really put the you know, the emphasis on the person taking responsibility for recognising that humans have a tendency to see the negative, live in not even the glass is half full, the glass is one third full and going down from evaporation. Don't stay there. It's too detrimental. Right. So he wanted to turn that around. He, as a psychologist, he wanted to be a glasser half mm. full. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting because I... Having heard that, I, my eyes then pricked up as I saw different things whip past me in the social media stream. One of them was uh, Emmanuel from Flinders Run. He, uh, we're working with him on his website at this time of recording, and he made a comment to his wine industry friends. He says, in business, 
We can get bogged down worrying about the negative news we read on social media, the impacts of these trying times are inflicting on the, the wine and related industries. But in amongst the doom and gloom, there are shining stories surfacing. It's important as a business owner to take the time to reflect on your work and celebrate the wins, no matter the size, big or small. They are your wins and the result of your hard work and tenacity pushing forward in your pursuit for success. Would it be right to say Glasser would approve this style of thinking? Because it's not uh, just him alone. I've heard lots of different people. Uh, we're reading a book at the moment called The Decisive Mind and makes a point of acknowledging those little triumphs you have along the way, a little bit of reward. So this does, Emmanuel seems to be bottling that. He's very much tapping into something that you know lots of people have thought about and it's something sort of listeners that's useful for anyone who wants to, you know, try and counter negativity. And what positive psychologists, and it is a whole discipline now, have told us is that for every negative you encounter, it takes three positive things to counter the negative. So don't, you know, doom scroll on social media because it takes so much positive to counter it. And a really big tool in positive psychology for making sure you see the positive in the world is last thing before you go to bed at night, piece of paper and a pencil, write down in three sentences what went well and why. You know, three instances of what went well and why. And it doesn't matter if you did it, the world did it, another person was kind. You just want to capture at the end of every day three little things that went well and why. And if that's the last thing in your head, that counters the negatives of the day more effectively. And if you need to in the morning, look over at it and remind yourself that's how your day ended with three positives. You know, to remind yourself to look for the positives rather than to just get lost in the negatives you know, as the day goes on. That's actually a pretty handy thing to do and not that hard. I've known about it for a while. I've never done yeah. it. So, David, you've got permission every time we meet to ask me. Have you put the pen and paper behind, beside your bed yet? Can you yep. take on that responsibility? I can do that for you. Now, <laughs> I tend to do it with a computer because, of course, writing would be pointless for me, but I find it actually works really well when I'm stressed. Wow. It's a really good way to counter stress. I maybe do it a couple of weeks a year when I feel my stress level is just too high. So okay. last year, just as the other master's thesis was being finished and you know, my cousin was dying of cancer. It was like, right, I need a formal structure here mm -hmm. to take the edge off the day. And it worked as well as it's always worked. Yeah. And one last uh, observation, another podcast I create for uh, National Centre for Vocational Education Research, it's called Vocational Voices. We recorded one for National Skills Week. And one of the speakers was saying, when you see figures come out for an industry, they might say, Hospo, hospitality jobs, they're disappearing. He said, remember they're talking at a macro average level. Within that sector, there are still new jobs being advertised. So we need to almost have a judicious approach to the way we absorb news, articles, whatever, to not just run away with the emotional depth charge that the author has laden it with, but let that blast, let that disappear, but then apply some sort of rationality to to uh, look behind the details. Probably you're not a bad thing to do at all. So I'm hoping that uh, helps bring some light at the end of the tunnel and some uh, strategies for maintaining a buoyancy as we push through in whatever endeavour we're involved in. Our four Ps. Number two, principles. You can never be overdressed or overeducated. Oscar Wilde. In the principles segment, I want to reflect again. We have mentioned him once in the past, uh, Owen Eastwood and his, his book about community. Again, another book he recommended to me, David, that is absolute gold out there and not one I would have necessarily picked off the, off the tree. What was it that caught your attention with this particular book? It was really the fact that, you know, my boss in America, Richard, was asking me, you know, how does community get built? And like most of the questions he asked me, I then went, 
uh, I'll get back to you in a week. <laughs> so I went off and found Charles Vogel's book and Owen Eastwood's book and then did this really quick dive where the Eastwood book is the really enjoyable, inspiring book and the Charles Vogel book is the technical how-to book. And between the two of them, it's just a lovely combination of here's how it works and here's how to physically structure one. Yes, and Owen Eastwood, to uh, do the, the short version, he is a New Zealander of Maori descent and he has forged a role in this world where he helps different organisations, sporting clubs in particular, grasp a sense of community and togetherness in what they're doing. And he draws on a concept called whakapapa, which is a Maori concept, which I describe it as understanding that where you are right now is the result of a history of people who have come before you, one before the other, stretching back. There could be within a business, it could be within a family, within some sort of pursuit, a sporting club, an institution, etc. And it seems common sense at surface level, but none of us, it seems, actually stop and pay attention to that. And it can bring profound impact and uh, insight to what it is that you're engaged with on a day-to-day basis. I was lucky enough to snare an interview with Owen Eastwood because at the time of this recording going out, the Adelaide Show podcast, which is my lovely passion project, had just turned 10 years old. It turned 10 on the 29th of August, uh, 2023. And to celebrate, I had an hour-long chat with Owen about all things to do with community, but I asked him how he would approach doing a community-focused thing like the Adelaide Show podcast with this whakapapa concept behind the scenes. And I was also, in the process of the interview, basically thinking out loud and saying, you know what, I don't think... I got as close to being pure community as I could have. Let's have a listen to some of his uh, reflections on that statement. Well, we can go back to where we started, which was that Maori idea of whakapapa. Adelaide has its own origin story. And that, and you know, and that predates Europeans. Okay. And and so it's a, it's a long story, but you, are part of the line of people that make up the people of Adelaide, right? So you are, you are, as as I'm sure some of your ancestors and they would have come from different places as well. But they're part, you're, you're part of the Adelaide story. All the people that are going to come in generations and generations in the future, you're part of this line of people. Mm. And the way I would think about it is that you know the sun has now moved on to you, and as part of you, you're a guardian for the community you live in. We all are, just as you know, as families, you're a guardian of the family. You're a guardian of this community, and what you've decided to do is to create the Adelaide Show, which is something which celebrates this unique, amazing place, which people feel a profound sense of belonging to. It's a way of connecting the past, the present, and the future of Adelaide through different conversations and different experiences you can have. Um, it's a place where people come and feel part of a community. And they're listening to your pod. And you know, other the pods I listen to, I genuinely feel I'm part of that community. It's it's quite even though I never get to meet the other people in the community, there's something about that. And even when, yeah, so so to me, that's in this day and age, which is a technology is important, it's important to be part of a community so people yeah. can be part of your community. You know, ultimately, when the sun moves on from you in the future, this will be part of the legacy that you've you have left. And I think it's a wonderful thing to have done. And you know, there's no limits really around how you can utilize that, is there? Because the 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 idea of representing all of Adelaide, the idea of creating a place of community, the idea of creating opportunities for an Adelaide to connect with each other and to have experiences, all of that is like quite mind-boggling as to what where you could go with it all. So to me, I think if you elevate it above, you know, your own interest in interviewing people and some of those things and elevate it to I'm actually doing this for a purpose. Mm. It's for the people of Adelaide. Yeah, it's it, to showcase us, it's to represent us. Then we, well, where could it go? Well, it's fascinating. I think in getting ready for this, because your book really does, it ricochets in my head. 
I changed the wording on the homepage from originally about, uh, I forget what it was, to you are not alone. Mm. And yeah. you can spend time with people who also share South Australia with you. Mm. And I, I think, uh, to me, that's where it, if that is earnestly what is being done here, then I think that's fine. It will carry through. But I know there are people who run different groups and community. It's not just, this is not just me. This is for anyone else listening in who wants to do something community-based. I really do appreciate the fact that that, that Whakapapa vision of looking for where this had begun and acknowledging that, hey, the sun's shining on you at the moment. What do you, what's your responsibility? And what do you think for the, the future? How do we check ourselves to make sure it's not ego driven? Driven? Have you got any? Because in sport and some of your big performers, ego must surely get tangled up. Is there is there a way to disarm it, or is can we like a surfer making use of the energy of a wave? Can we harness the energy of our egos? That's a that's a that's a great way to put it. I mean, we want ego, but we want it to be aligned with a higher purpose. So you know, there is no great teams I'm aware of where there aren't strong egos, if you want to use that expression. So that's not a problem. And the same with the Adelaide show with your, and also what is not a problem as well is if we have a financial incentive or motivation around what we're doing, there's nothing wrong with that. What's important is to be authentic about what we're trying to achieve and why mm -hmm. and articulate that. And, um, you, but you can do both things at once. You can have an amazing personal journey and have your ego um, flying as well as representing your country. And you can also have a business which is brings great value and benefit to a community and at the same time has a financial en engine which you're running as well. Those things can go together. That's it's about being authentic about what they are. And, you know, sometimes... Um, these don't think be, have to be things that last for 100 years. You might decide the Adelaide show, for example, is something which is so woven with who you are that it's a project that you will do for a set period of time may not go to another generation. So that, that they're all fine. There are no rules around this, but it's just making sure that when the sun's shining on you, you make the most of the opportunity. All right. So he was very generous in his comments there, but... I think from the, the reason I wanted to bring it up in this conversation, David, is, and this has come up with different conversations I've had recently, you can go through the motions of whatever enterprise or activity you're engaged in. In fact, I just finished recording another interview uh, for Vocational Voices in which there was reflection on a particular training program. And the thing, the cream that rose to the top that made it successful is everyone engaged didn't just do the job. They tapped into the spirit of what was trying to be achieved. They dug deeper. They actually crafted meaning out of what could have just been purely transactional. And I think that's within arm's reach for many of us if we want it to be. Would that be a good takeaway from Owen Eastwood's work, David? I think a great way to combine, you know, your experience with that, you know, conversation you were talking about there and with Owen's work is you don't find meaning, you make it. You don't find community, you make it. And in both cases, if you connect to other people who've already made meaning or made community, when you join, you don't passively join what they've already done. You have to add something to it because it's now different because you're involved. So it's always a case of, you know, not just turning up. I remember reading a great book uh, about resilience that made the argument optimism is important, but it has to be active optimism. Passively hoping things will be okay doesn't work. You have to actively make them okay. And I think meaning and community are much the same. Passively waiting to find meaning and community, well, it'll just you know go past you on the road. Why would the road train stop for you if you haven't got your arm out waving? You have to actively be seeking to join in and contribute. And you know the NCVER sort of perspective really captures that very well, getting people involved in doing things that are meaningful. 
And interestingly, the project that I talked about there was working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, health workers and everyone involved had to take the approach of having yarn time and reflection time. And so I think I can't help but, but want to see that there's something from that ancient culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Maori culture, that perhaps our Western culture hasn't quite got the the roots as deep as, or if they are, we don't pay attention to them. Am I being overly romantic on that, or are you? Can you see there is something there? When you were talking about that, then it immediately made me think of Tyson Yunker Porter, who wrote Sand Talk, and I can't remember if it's in the book specifically or when I interviewed Tyson, but he made the point that yarning as an activity with a group has some really important rules within you know, Indigenous culture, and that is you let people say whatever they want to say, and you let them speak until they're finished. Because it's not about getting an answer to a question now. It's about hearing all the things that might be relevant and getting the bigger picture. And that's really hard in our rushed modern world, where it's like, I've got a question, give me an answer. No, 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 I don't want all the context. Well, actually, without all the context, how are we going to know if we've found the answer? So it's about us slowing down and giving ourselves and others the time to say what they need to say so that we can find the meaning or the community in all of the things that are part of the broader context. That is the frustration. This whole yeah. thing, you've got to invest time in it to get yeah. to get the rewards. And in a way of sort of drawing this segment to a close with something actionable, one of the things that is a common theme with all of Owen Eastwood's work is, and, and, and I, I encourage you, if you haven't, to listen to The Adelaide Show, episode 380, uh, to hear Owen go into this in full. But getting people to sit down, uh, he had the, 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 the head honchos of NATO, you know, three or four really important generals, actually take time to stop and tell each other the story of how they got to be where they are, which is an incredible investment of time if you think about all the stuff, mm. all the pressure on them. But he's done that with uh, people at IBM. He's done that with the South African cricket team and so on and so on. And from it, the fruits are magnificent. We're doing it at the moment as we experiment with our own community called the High Table, which we'll be sharing more and more about as we go through this process of taking that time to listen to other people's journeys about how they got to where they are because you see commonalities as well as differences and it's really simple but everything i was confessing to you david everything in me wants to i think it's my radio background I want to keep keep things ticking over quickly You've got to really quench that urge and give time so in a workplace, in an organisation, you may not be able to do this with 150 employees in one group, but the smaller groups, the smaller departments taking this time will probably yield greater rewards than you might imagine. Your final thoughts, David? Yeah, I think a practical step we could take away from this is if you just want to have a conversation with someone to get to know them and how they see what's going on. That is actually really worthwhile to do that broader context to understand where they're coming from and how it contributes. And that will probably take twice as much time as you think it will. But from that point onwards, you and that person will understand each other better and you will understand the context they're coming from. They will appreciate having been given the time and it will most likely lead to a better and more effective working relationship. So it's worth the effort of finding the time early to improve the relationship and the communication long term. Our four Ps. Number three, problems. I asked the question for the best reason possible. Simple curiosity. Oscar Wilde. I mentioned in the last segment, David, doing the Adelaide Show podcast for 10 years, 
I had a little bit of a surprise just recently when I received a legal letter uh, because this AI bot has been crawling the web uh, looking for any use of images that uh, weren't properly licensed. And so this is a really timely segment, probably one of the most important ones from the mailbag that we've gone through, just happens to be my mailbag. It turns out that for a backdrop image thrown together quickly a few years ago, I grabbed a picture of an empty theater and uh, it must have been an absolute brain fade because I don't do that as a normal thing. I would go to sources and either be my material that I'm using or sources where things are properly licensed. Anyway, the letter came in wanting $1,400 on behalf of Associated Press to have payment as well as removing the image. I chatted with local lawyer, uh, Paul Gordon. I don't mind mentioning his name. He's a wonderful human and lawyer. And he said, look, they are within their rights to ask this and these letters are popping up everywhere now. Mm. Uh, but it does seem excessive. Ask them to rethink the amount, uh, especially because the Adelaide Show makes zero money. It is purely a commercial, uh, a community venture. Uh, lo and behold, they said actually they had wrongly categorized it and the, the figure was like 700 and something dollars. And we tried one more time to, to try and get that lowered, but that was the amount which has now been paid and it's going to be a real thing. So I've often told people not to do it. I just got caught out by doing it myself and rightfully chastened. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure everything else I've ever used has been original or properly licensed. But I think if you've ever decided to take a shortcut and use the general image from the internet, these AI bots uh, can detect images uh, with great accuracy and uh, you may be getting a letter like this. So to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So... You can learn from my mistake, and I hope you'll all go through any material you've got now, and if you have done a dodgy, get that rectified. And unsplash.com is a wonderful site for accessing images that you're allowed to use legally. I've got the paid version, which is not very much money at all. Uh, from memory, it was 60 or $80 a year, and you have access to a lot of beautifully licensed images that you're allowed to use for free. Our four Ps, number four, perspicacity. The one duty we owe to history is to rewrite it. Oscar Wilde. We still live in the Sander submarine. Hello, David. I'm trying not to laugh aloud because I don't want to make the editing difficult for Tim. Uh, so perspicacity, where we think about our thinking, we reflect on things. We have dedicated this segment, this series, to the wonderful book by David Sandler. You can't teach a kid to ride a bicycle in a seminar. And it's his approach to sales. If you haven't listened to episodes one and two of series three, please go back and listen to them first to put this into context. Because one of the things he developed was this Sandler submarine, a seven step process in approaching the realm of sales in a methodical and psychologically sound process. We looked at part one last episode. Part two is called the upfront contract. So we've built rapport now, and now it's about dealing with our client and setting the terms of an upfront contract. What does that mean, David? I think I'll give a description here first, because this is something all of us will have been experienced. We are going to talk to a client or a potential client. You know, the, the client that we already have, maybe an upsell, the potential client, you know, the first purchase of our services or product. And we can just tell their tense and they're waiting for us to snare them. And we wonder why they're feeling that way because well, we try not to behave like that. But if you really think how many times you've interacted with a salesperson and they've tried to snare you or they've tried to have the ha-ha moment and capture you, you know, get your leg in your wallet and checkbook you know, trapped in a bear trap. And Sandler realized the best way to get around this was to lay out what we're going to talk about today, 
what we can both expect to achieve, that it's okay to ask questions, that it's okay to say, uh, this isn't going well, I don't understand, uh, I want us to go back to first principles, and to have an idea where we're going to be at the end of our meeting so that nothing is an ambush, nothing is dangerous, nothing is too confronting. And he called this whole process the upfront contract. And it's a disarmingly simple concept at one level because it's just common sense. It's just something in the dance of sales that isn't named typically. My feeling is everyone should do upfront contracts as often as possible when there's any chance that the conversation they're going to have with someone could be misunderstood or could lead to unnecessary tension that is then going to have an emotional impact on both people. Why not just spend 30 seconds laying out what you'd like to talk about and letting the other person know they can ask questions at any point and it's totally okay to say if they're not sure what's going on, what it means, or they feel uncomfortable. David, in his own words, wasn't a born salesperson. And he was trying to figure out how do I survive in this world where I don't understand the rules and I wasn't brought up in a sales household. And so what he did out of self-protection is he ran into problems maybe like any other salesperson. He would show up in an hour call and he was moving, it was going well. The prospect would look at their watch 25 minutes into it and said, hey, David, this sounds really interesting, but could you put what you said in writing? Because we've got a lot of fires today. We're going to have to cut it short. And I think in sales in general, people just show up with an agenda that's not really shared with the prospect. And if you think about a conversation, and where sales is a conversation, right? That takes two different sides to kind of converse. So in essence, Sandler was looking for something that said, here's why we're here today, Gerhard. And here's how much time that we'll spend during the meeting. And then what would you like to get out of that meeting? And here's some of my agenda items. And that was the basic framework. So we often say that it's good to name the 900-pound gorilla in the room. With the upfront contract, I suppose what we're saying is upfront, we're going to name some potential 900-pound gorillas that might enter the room, and I just want you to know that I know they might be entering the room, and this is a range of reactions to their entering that we might agree are all suitable. Is that yep. is that one way of putting it? That's a pretty much a great summary because the great thing is it's not just providing a trigger warning as is happening in more and more environments now. You know, trigger warning, this thing may trigger this in you. No, that's that's too narrowly defined. And it's not giving that other person the power to shape the interaction. The great thing with the upfront contract is you're saying this could happen and any of these responses I'm about to list off you are perfectly okay, and I'd be totally comfortable for you to respond in any of these ways. Even to say you're uncomfortable is something I'm totally comfortable with. So you're giving people agency and making sure it's a conversation you know, rather than a hard sell, which is what Sandler didn't like doing to people and realized doesn't actually work. Because the minute people have got their backs up and they feel they're being attacked or cornered, Maybe you can get them to say yes, just so you go away, but they'll cancel the check or the transaction an hour after you've left the office. So much better to actually have a conversation where you empower the other person to say you know, how they're feeling, to ask what they want to know, and to let you know if you're not being clear. So much better a place to be. Yes, because he does re re reflect in his sales career of uh, the danger of having someone say, oh, look, that sounds good. We'll think it over. We'll get back to you mm. about the salesperson then going back to the office and say, hey, boss, I've got one. And he's saying, no, you actually have nothing, nothing. at that point. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps we'll finish with a couple of examples of this, but the example he talked about there in his application of the upfront contract is to be on the phone or in person with a prospect saying, we're about to talk about this. And there are a couple of things that will be fine. Either I have convinced you of the usefulness of my solution and you can afford it and we're all happy, in which case you say, yes, let's proceed. Or I might fail to do that 
and you might not think we're the right fit for you or the right solution, in which case I want you to know and to tell me that you'll be okay saying to me, no, this is not for us, at which case I'll wish you good afternoon and I will leave. What I don't want us to do is to get to the point where you say, I need to think it over. Uh, can we agree up front that, that if, if, if that is where you're at, we'll consider that it is a no and we'll close the books at that point or engage in further conversation if we think that's possible. Uh, that, that's one example he used, isn't it, David? Yeah, it, it's the classic Sandler one, and it's very much the sales-oriented one. That The ultimate way to put a decision off is to say, we need more time or I need to brief other people. So part of an upfront contract with David Sandler would be to say, okay, if I'm going to come and do a presentation uh, to the decision makers about whether you're going to potentially invest in our product or service, are you the only decision maker or is there a broader group? Is it worth me presenting to you if there is a broader group or should we schedule a time for everyone? Or are you not interested and it would be much better to say this is over now? So it can be used in a lot of different ways, but to always give a little bit of power back to someone and show that you respect them. And traditional salespeople out there, I imagine, yeah, you're probably you know, squirming in your seats going, don't give power away, don't lose control. That world's over, I think. I, I don't see any more how you can arm twist people into decisions. They will jump onto social media or write reviews and beg the company, bag the product, bag the way you behaved as a salesperson. And we'll spend years recovering from that negative social media review, which remains evergreen. So really, Sandler in 1968 came up with a way of dealing with a world that hadn't even been invented yet, a world where poor behavior got pointed out and lasted forever, which is where we live now. Mm. Perhaps just to finish off this conversation, you have argued that we should be using the upfront contract even in relationships and other parts of life. Could you perhaps leave us with an example of where you've used an upfront contract that's not been strictly in a work environment, David? Yeah, I often catch up with my former students because you know, they just want to talk through their, their mid-20s, they're trying to work out what to do with their lives. And I'm always happy to go, well, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? But I've found what I've added to that, and it seems to go, well, makes them more comfortable is, okay, what we're going to do today is talk about what you might want to do next. So let's set up some guidelines here. One, I'm not you. I'm never going to be you. And I don't know that much about you that I can anticipate what you're going to do. But I care. And anything I say is coming from a perspective of caring. But you can say no to any and all of it without hurting my feelings. And even if you say no to whatever we talk about today, you can come back whenever you need to and pick my brain again about the next thing you need to talk about. And it doesn't matter if you disagree with me then either. It's simply, I'm here to bounce ideas off and I won't take it personally if you end up not agreeing with what I say because how can I definitely be right when I'm not you? All right, there you go. Challenge set down to consider upfront contracts. Obviously, the book itself is highly recommended to read because it gives you a lot more background and nuance into all of this. You can't teach a kid to ride a bicycle in a seminar. Until next time, David, I would like to set an upfront contract with you. Would you be happy to record episode four of series three and share thoughts? And if I happen to share a thought you don't agree with, would you promise to counter what I've said and suggest a different way of phrasing what I've done. I can agree to all of that. I also will agree that to the best of my ability, we will do all these things with humour, good nature and kindness. And we've got that recorded. That's another little trick. <laughs> Thanks again, David. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening to Talking About Marketing. If you enjoyed it, please leave a rating or a review in your favorite podcast app. And if you found it helpful, please share it with others. Steve and David always welcome your comments and questions. So send them to podcast at talkedaboutmarketing.com. And finally, the last word to Oscar Wilde. There's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about. Hi. 
Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.